Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm Joe. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about Season 2, Episode 8, titled Bushido, which I know, Melissa, you have been dying to get to this episode. I'm very excited to talk about this episode. <laughs> <laughs> it originally premiered on November 22nd, 1985. It was written by John Leakley, who only wrote this one and one other episode titled When Irish Eyes Are Crying. The director of this episode is none other than the edward james almost and yes the- and i think that they should let him direct many many more it's unfortunate <laughs> this is his only one i agree <laughs> <laughs> I was actually for sure that it was going to be the same director as Golden Triangle because it felt very much the same as as the second half of Golden Triangle. But this is this is probably one of the better thematic and visual episodes of Miami Vice that we've seen. So credit to Eddie James, as you call them, John. <laughs> that is yes. not proper. E. That is not his name. <laughs> Edward. Good old EJ almost. <laughs> I'm going to tweet him and ask him if we can call him that. Oh, I follow him on Twitter. Big Ed. <laughs> <laughs> follow big ed yep i do <laughs> before we get started like checking and see what's going on in each other's lives and guys we record this episode on sundays and then it publishes on thursday we started a little bit late tonight because we just watched one of the most epic super bowls in the super bowl history i need to remind you all to respect where it needs to be given five super bowl rings Four Super Bowl MVPs, seven Super Bowl appearances, the GOAT, Tom Brady. It was a very Tom Brady-like Super Bowl because, you know, the Falcons went up with such a big lead so early. There's just so much time left. Like, there's no way this game is over yet. You yeah. know, and then slowly but surely, the Patriots just came on back like the Patriots, you, you know, just slowly got better like the Patriots do, you know. And by the end of the game, I was like, oh, yeah, he's going to win. <laughs> it just it fits i understand I, I think right now i think right now half of nfl fans are hoping that this he retires rides off into the sunset like Manning <laughs> did. i'm sure it was the same thing with the yankees in the 90s right everyone was just waiting for player after player to finally retire that way baseball can get on with their lives ouch (laughs) yes that is actually that is you nailed it that's a dead on analogy right there (laughs) this isn't a sports podcast although i'm sure me and john can have plenty of debates about the uh, winners and losers of this super bowl so let's get over and talk about this episode of miami vice so we open up and it's a classic Miami Vice open because there's all kinds of weird stuff going down. <laughs> we open up down at the pier. It's at night. It's hot. Everyone is very, very sweaty. And sticky. <laughs> <laughs> we do get a little bit of a change here, though. Not everyone is playing a prostitute. Some people are just homeless. Hey, some <laughs> people are buried in the sand, okay? <laughs> I am not, I'm not sure. Is Trudy... Is Trudy playing a prostitute? Because no. she's on roller skates. She's just playing and a that roller to me skater. Means that she's probably she's probably not a prostitute. But I don't know. Maybe prostitutes do uh, <laughs> roller skate. I mean, I guess you could cover um, more ground that way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I kind of miss roller skates, you know, like roller blades. There's nothing, it, I don't feel like there's a- anything in this generation that kind of replaced it. Scooters. Oh my scooters. God, scooters. Yeah, where we live, it's all really? about the scooter. High school kids scooter to school. I'm like, what is with you? <laughs> Why are you scootering? You're like 16. Don't you have a driver's license or something in a car? <laughs> There's people roller. It's not just Trudy that's roller skating. There's other people roller skating. It's a bunch of homeless people ha- hanging out. At, like it's it's kind of like a um, pier. The the other pier numbers other than 39 in San Francisco. There's all the 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 empty buildings along the coast. It's just the bathrooms, mm. basically. It's because it's mm-hmm. the bathrooms that they hang out there. Mm. For, you know, mm-hmm. see, uh, CD stuff hang happens in bathrooms in public places <laughs> at night. So. <laughs> so the duo, they're across the street and they're watching. So Zito and Swiatek, Gina and Trudy are all in bid down with all these homeless people that are hanging out near the bathroom. What they're waiting for is a man named Herrera to come pull up. They're going to do a drug deal with a DA agent that's working with the vice team. The DA agent is none other than the Tom Waits. Yeah, so you might remember him or we might remember him from the Warriors, one of uh, our classic favorite. Oh, yeah. Know, but he also has that crime story connection to that we see so often as Michael Mann likes to uh, use the same people in all of his projects. It's like the Christopher Nolan of TV then, right? He just uses the same people over and over again. <laughs> uh-huh. I, but, you know, it, it's... 
Tubbs and Crockett are having kind of an interesting conversation here. You know, they're talking about this DEA agent, and Tubbs is, I, I guess, trying to say like he's some. Uh, I don't, I, I don't quite get it. You know, he's some special forces, khaki underwear wearing. <laughs> <laughs> he's, I'm he's, not exactly sure what that has to do with the uh, and, uh, and what he's like as an agent. He's trying to say like he's by the book, like he's a good agent, like he's a soldier. He follows the rules. You know, like that's what he's trying mm. to say. Interesting, yeah, because Crockett's also telling a story about the about Herrera the last time the DEA agent tried to get himself embedded with Herrera he ended up going on a quote fishing trip and we all know what that means well he describes that they used him as bait so <laughs> later on in the conversation he says he went on a fishing trip and never came back and, and we think he he was cut up and used as bait basically <laughs> well in the middle of this co- conversation Herrera's Herrera and his men come pulling up onto shore so the vice's plan goes into action and what the plan is is that Herrera's going to come up with his men and they're going to do a drug deal with the DEA agent they're going to go into the bathroom and then when they go in there the vice team's going to lock up all of Herrera's men and then move in on Herrera. This thing kicks off without a hitch. Like, it's actually impressive how the Vice Squad thing goes uh, oh, yeah. at the beginning here. They get the drop on all the bad guys. Vice Jesus comes appearing out of the <laughs> sand like a predator. Because he is Jesus. It's that hair. Uh, His hair helped him you know, stay under the sand all that time. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, skates it's, up it's like on it's someone. Swite yeah, is pretending yeah, to puke and he makes a move on someone. Zito takes his snorkel out of the sand he pops up out of this he's buried in the sand i mean that is that is legit yeah dude i'm telling you i'm i'm thinking like they 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 finally got one right there's no way this can go uh south exactly and what i didn't mention is that we see right before the sting happens uh, another homeless man walks into the bathroom and then Right before they go make the sting, the homeless man, that same homeless man walks out of the bathroom. So they make their move on everyone. Tubbs and Crockett go in to go bust down Herrera. And when they get in there, the DEA agent is tied up on the toilet with his pants down, too. Like, he actually went in there to take a dump and then make the bust at the same time. <laughs> hey, he had priorities, okay? He had to poop, and then he needed to make the bust. <laughs> and then Herrera is dead, hanging upside down with his face covered in cocaine. And Crockett yeah, just yells out, so, what the hell is going on here? And we end the scene. Yeah, so it uh, it almost goes well, which begs the question, have they ever had a successful bust, like legitimately successful, where everything just went the way it was supposed to go? Yeah, they get the drugs, they get the money, they make the arrest, no one dies, no police officers get killed, no gangsters get killed, everyone just gets arrested. None that I can remember immediately. The people getting killed is not a big deal. As long as they get arrested, (laughs) that's all that matters. As long as they have nice stuff. Yeah, and, and, for the, and for the record, this was not their fault. <laughs> but no. they were so close, like everything else went right. Yep, but and then, has, it was out of their control. They had no control over this. Mm-hmm. They did everything they were supposed to do, and it just went bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love how the homeless guy that comes out right before the bus goes down, like, that's not suspicious at all. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you think they would arrest? The yeah, no, you they think they apparently. would arrest anyone that would come in or out of that bathroom during that time? No, no matter what. Well, what was he doing? Like, oh, we didn't want to interrupt the homeless guy dropping the deuce. No, <laughs> we're just gonna have to do this thing. <laughs> well, yeah, they they specifically waited for him to come out before they did their bust. They waited for him to come out, and then they made the call to go make the bust. When we come back from the opening credits, we're back at the precinct. And the team's given Castillo the rundown. The D agent says, hey, we got what we wanted. Herrera's dead. Yes, we're, but Castillo says, yeah, but the, we're missing $500,000. And that's what we come to find out. That's what happened here is that the reason why they left the drugs is because just because they took the money. That homeless person that went in there, it's obvious now, he went in there and made the hit. He took the money, but didn't take any of the drugs. Crockett is quick to say, hey, we screwed up. But the DH is like, hey, whatever. Wash is a wash. We got what we wanted. Herrera's dead. Yeah. And he makes a point to call Crockett a cracker cop. <laughs> <laughs> Which begs the question, is he aware that he is also white? <laughs> I think he meant like a Cracker Jack cop. You know, like, oh, you're... Like, basically, you're not like a very a good cop. Yeah, like, mm-hmm. it's a joke. You're a joke of a cop. But he was the one with his pants down and a gag in his <laughs> mouth. Like, uh, it just caught me off guard because the scene's going and then he's just like, cracker. Like, wait a minute. <laughs> whoa, whoa. <laughs> Okay, in the 80s, that didn't mean the same thing, clearly. <laughs> it meant something different. <laughs> well, neither Crockett or Castillo are happy with the DA agent. And to be honest with you, in looks, 
suspicious. He's tied up. The money's missing. They got what they wanted, but they didn't see anything that was happening. The DEA agent said, all he knows is that he got squeezed in the neck and he saw stars. And that was it. So he got the Vulcan pinch of death, survived it. <laughs> yes. And didn't see yeah. anything or, or as, hear anything. Or as we like to call it, the Marty. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. He got Marty. So, and, <laughs> Ninja look, grasp. I think, and obviously we all go to the homeless guy. Eventually we get around to, oh, hey, what about that homeless guy? <laughs> Eventually, um, yeah. Marty goes back to look uh, at the video, like, wait a minute. Yes. Pulled up the video evidence, and we find it's Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> in that real grainy video, Castile walks over, drops the tape back in, because the whole team leaves. Oh, sorry, the whole team is there. They're still just thinking. Castile walks over, drops the cassette tape into the VCR, sees in that grainy green video. He sees the homeless man, as he's walking out, stop and look directly at the camera. He pauses it, and Castillo says, I know exactly who that is. That's Jack Gretzky. We used to work together in the intelligence community. Well, they used to do more than work together. (laughs) Jack Gretzky. Okay, is that like Wayne Gretzky's older brother? (laughs) (laughs) And then Castillo goes in to describe that he's a solo worker. Death is his profession. He sees everything. Obviously, they have a big past, but it sounds suspicious at this point, as in they have a bad past. That's what it sounds like now, that Castillo and Gretzky they know each other because of some horrible thing that probably happened in Bangkok or something like that. And, and Castillo kind of warns them to like just stay out of it, like don't walk down the same side of the street as him. Yeah, so like yeah, basically tell yeah. him, basically tell him like stay out of my blood feud. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he said like for for their own safety, like don't mm-hmm. try and get involved in this. I will handle it. You under no circumstances are to get involved in this at all because he knows this like between ninjas. Yep. <laughs> and the crew, the whole vice team is there. They just look like confused and really scared. They all look like a virgin on prom night. They don't know what's going on. They don't know what's going to happen. They just know they're supposed to be here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Crockett begs to help Castillo, but Castillo says, like, I know where he is. I know what to do. Just stay out of this. This is none of your business, which is suspicious again, because it's like, this is. We went to make a bust, and the guy we're busting is dead, and we think it's this homeless guy. What do you mean Vice shouldn't be involved So it this? totally is their business. <laughs> it is our yes. business. Yeah. For once, they yeah. actually were trying to do the right thing. He's like, no, I don't need you. Get out of here. No, no, no. no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's like, nope, case closed. Go back to uh, busting prostitutes. I'll be back in like five days. <laughs> But first, I'm going to go to an adult bookstore. So yes. Castillo says, I know exactly where to find him. And then we jump cut to an adult video store. <laughs> and so he first walks in. It's like, oh, he's a regular. It's like, hey, Marty. We got the new uh, Big Butts magazine in for you. <laughs> Well, let's talk about this room a little bit. He comes walking in. It's not in the store. It's clearly in like a back office, right? There's a lot going on in this room. There's a typewriter. There's like a... a <laughs> There's a proje- typewriter. That's what you go to first. Yes. Well, I got, a typewriter. I got, a, I got, a, I got a lead with the normal stuff. <laughs> there's a typewriter. There's a there's a slide deck and a projector for pictures. They're looking at the pictures before they're pu- pu- putting them in the slide deck. There's polka dots all over the walls. It's pink or purple walls with polka dots all over it. There's a sign on the wall that says cheap and trashy. And then there's a collection of naked mannequin body parts on the floor next to the door. There's a lot of fun stuff going on in this room. (laughs) And two guys that look like used car salesmen. (laughs) (laughs) And you say like, Castillo creepily opens the door, and the first person pops up like, hey, Marty, come on in. We're just getting ready to bone down with this mannequin. (laughs) Yeah. Good to see you. Well, why did he look so creepy when he opened the door? He, like, opened the door, like, peeked one eye in and was like, oh, okay. Then I'll go in. And and they were kind of like, they kind of had that Mr. Rogers feel, like, even when they were threatening, like, by golly, geez, Marty. (laughs) Yeah, I know. know. But they... These are two, as they refer to them in the episode, they're with the agency or they're with, they're in the company. intelligence. Yeah, they're with the company. It's the CIA. These are two CIA officers. I love how, or agents. I, I love, 
how they try and build up Castillo's character with like how much mystery and stuff with him. The CIA makes a point to say like before Vietnam, we have no idea where you were. You were you you don't exist. You mm-hmm. and Gretzky before Vietnam. So like mm-hmm. they build up the lore of the great Castillo who came out of nowhere. Even the CIA didn't know he, he existed uh, before Be- because then. Castillo is kung fu, John. You hit it out of the park when we did Golden Triangle. Yes, yes, he is <laughs> kung fu. <laughs> <laughs> and he was wandering around solving problems. <laughs> He's still doing it. <laughs> uh, One of the men, Carter, he he like so Castillo was there to ask what the deal is, why Gretzky is there, but they're also asking Castillo, like, we don't know why he's here. We're hoping you could tell us why he's why he's here. And Carter Carter, one of the CIA men, he doesn't like Castillo. He's like, I don't want to deal with your petty problems. I just want to get to the bottom of why Gretzky he is actually, here. Actually, the first thing he says to Castillo is, my name is Carter, and I don't like you, see? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's when they say that they checked in on Castillo. There's no history of him before Vietnam. But we also find out that Castillo and Gretzky, go, they go way back to golden to the Golden Triangle. They've been working together forever. They've done a bunch of work. They're, they're a feared duo in the cia they start to find out they tell yeah. him what happened with gretzky that they say that he defected to the russians years ago and then he's been on the run for being a traitor but now he's defected from russia and russia wants to kill him now so both the cia and the kgb are both looking for him and it has a lot of it to do with his wife yes because she defected too from the kgb right they, t- they talk about that how she worked for the kgb and then she defected too yeah so it's your you're a classic forbidden love, you know, KGB agent, falls in love with CIA agent, they have kid, escape Moscow, steal money from the Miami Vice, you know, mm-hmm. classic. <laughs> well, they said he was going, he had been going on a rampage, taking care of a bunch of people. So oh my been, God. He'd been stealing, he'd been stealing money and killing people along the way and they didn't know why he stopped in Miami. I just realized he's Archer. <laughs> oh <right>? my God. <laughs> because he gets cancer. And that's why he went on this rampage. (laughs) Well, I wish he was Archer, but he wasn't. (laughs) You know, and I thought of the Archer episode where his best friend fakes his death. Yeah, and he goes, and he's like, he's like convinced that he would never do anything, and he like loved him, and no, we were close, and he would never do that. And Lana's like, no, he was. Remember that time he did this, this, and this? He's like, oh, that was a coincidence. Like, no. (laughs) Yeah, I was totally, I, I totally thought of that when I was watching this episode especially later when marty meets up with gretzky yeah so that's where we're going next we're gonna head over to i think it's chinatown castillo's just walking around on the street i don't know what he's doing he's like just buying stuff from people on the street and the cia are following him castillo cuts through an eye like an alley and he goes from it was the next day so it's daytime he cuts through this alley pops into a buddhist temple this really foggy buddhist <laughs> temple there's all these clouds inside of the building he walks out into the backyard there's a nice nice big garden a bridge over water and now it's nighttime. So some magic happened when he went through the end of the garden. <laughs> it was too. a magic portal. <laughs> and I was really hoping this episode was going to end with a, like a Kung Fu battle. And mm-hmm. like this scene came about and it goes, oh, it's, I just thought in my head like, oh, it's early. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Marty walks over and it's Gretzky at the other end. It's, and they immediately recognize each other. And man, does it get sloppy and smushy and they're all smiles and they're very 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 happy to see each other we even get a very creepy smile from marty as he walks up so i think this is the perfect time to stop and talk about who plays jack gretzky that being dean stockwell who is i think probably most notable for his time on the show quantum leap as ziggy ziggy Uh, says you have to eat all the carrots yeah or you can't jump (laughs) I also remember him on Battlestar Galactica, also with Edward James Elmos. He uh, Oscar. He was but, also nominated for an Oscar too for supporting actor for uh, Married to the Mob. Oh Mom. yeah. So, but obviously, I bring that up because I want to point out that both of these guys are supposed to be badasses, and they're both kind of a uh, little skinny, weasley looking guys. Do you notice that? Yeah, they. 
They're both little they're, guys. They're, I guess, they're badasses in the way that Tom Cruise is portrayed as a badass. <laughs> um, they immediately start talking. Barty says that the CIA guys told him that he had defected. Gretzky asked if he believed it. Obviously, no. And we're starting to see now that they have a really deep relationship marty says he also thought that kresky died in bangkok years ago when Gretzky marty says, was when marty thought his wife died too that was what he meant like mm-hmm. when all that happened he thought that they both were dead that makes more sense that that was all one big event yep one big yeah. event yeah yeah see i thought they were just like shooting the shit so you know it was kind of like hey you remember that time we fought off 100 men with sword yeah <laughs> yeah it goes into this long story about the time they survived this assassination and that Mark marty said i thought for sure we would have died that night so then they they walk inside kind of like hand in hand like they they skip <laughs> arm together and arm. <laughs> back into the building Look, and it's it, it's even worse than that because Gretzky basically says man i want you to have my stuff when i die <laughs> yeah. like yeah. my wife and, and here. son <laughs> please take yeah, my wife and son yeah, when like i did it's getting really cryptic in the conversation he's basically like say promise me you'll take care of my wife and marty asks him why miami and gretzky says because you're the only man that i trust and so i've changed because of my wife i have my family i brought them here to miami when i die you you need to take care of them the code of the bushido code of the ninja warrior (laughs) marty hugs gretzky and after that conversation and it's like a very very passionate hug very much like they have a longer history than we will ever find out. After Gretzky gets his arms in between him and Marty and is able to create some separation from the hug, Gretzky walks away and he starts saying that everything's going to plan. And he flips around and he's got a gun. And he miraculously somehow misses Marty, but leaves Marty with no choice but to shoot and kill his best friend in Jack Gretzky. And let me- like that's a, that escalated quickly. That's the definition um, <laughs> a situation getting a whole lot worse very quickly. Because I mean, I did not see like a gunfight breaking out. I almost missed it when it <laughs> and happened. <you> and most, <laughs> I think you you can put this in a better perspective because you're such a big Marty fan. What starts this is that Marty says he has to bring Jack in, even though they're best friends. Marty's mm-hmm. always by the book, and because Marty's always by the book, and because. Now, I mean, we're going to see this obviously further on in the episode. You'll figure it out. But and Jack knows that that Marty is by the book. So he knows that he that by having him come meet him there or by running into him, he's going to have to try and bring him in. And Jack's going to have to he's going to have to do what he wanted to do, which is to get Marty to kill him because he doesn't want to go in. And that's the only way that everything could be the way it needs to be with his wife and his son and everything. It's basically he knows that Marty has a code. He can't break the law. He has Mm -hmm. to do everything by the book. For him to be okay with his life so he's going to bring him in even though it's his best friend in the world it's going to hurt him to do it so and, and in the long run jack knew that and that's why he had to kill him yep after jack is just laying there dead in the middle of the room some time passes and we see now that the duo has come they're behind time doesn't Castillo. pass <laughs> time does not pass crocodile and tubs just magically teleport in the room <laughs> I think they were hiding behind the curtain the whole time watching. <laughs> They're good like, at hide and seek. Like they were, we're following find their out big later. brother. You know, like we're we're tagging along yeah. with our big brother. He's gonna do something really cool. And then that, they follow. like, "Oh my god, <laughs> we saw that." That happen. is very true. And the whole key to this is that Crockett is like a little brother to Castillo, and he is yeah. very hurt. He is not allowed to play with Castillo during this time. He wants, like, he always wants Martin to need him. He's always mm-hmm. like, like when when the episode with his with the golden triangle, he's like, "Come on, let us help you. You know, you have us. Let us help you." And he's like, "No, I don't. I can't let you help me. I have to do it by the book. By the book. You know, him and his code." So yeah, Crockett's constantly like, "But please, I want to help you. Let me do it." <laughs> <laughs> the so CIA I think we can agents skip over. The, uh, I was gonna say, I think we could skip over the next part about Marty's conflicted meditating. <laughs> well, I was just gonna mention real fast that the CIA agents show up too, and Carter says, "Hey, we appreciate it. Gretzky outlived his usefulness. Thank you for killing, him so we don't have to deal with it anymore." Okay, have a good life, and they take off. Yeah, they're such jerks. They're so corny. Like, put it there, pal. <laughs> Thanks for killing your best friend. Now we don't have to do anything. Uh, we can go back and watch all the porn we want through those little peepholes. <laughs> <laughs> so now we have a couple of things that, that are really important, but they happen very quick. We have a brief stopover at Marty's house that night. We see him dr- drinking tea. He's having flashbacks of what happened that day. We go over to the precinct the next morning. 
Tubbs is working the phones and he is talking to the coroner and he finds out that the autopsy shows that Gretzky was riddled with cancer. We really? know now. No that- way. <laughs> yeah, I know. Shocking. <laughs> so the duo take off over to Castillo's house to go basically tell Marty like, hey, don't carry this so heavy. He, this was suicide by cop. He had cancer. He, this is all playing out exactly the way he wanted, but Marty's not there. All that's there is a note He's out in his shopping. It, it, it's like Marty, you know, he likes to get rid of stress by going out and sh- going shopping <laughs> and then meditating. <laughs> He's buying more of those puncture, tiny ties. He's buying more of those therapy. <laughs> Well, so I want to give you a chance here because this is, I know that that last scene is important because we talked about Marty does things by the books. And so that scene we see at Castillo's house is a note and he left his badge. That mm-hmm. is big for Marty. Yes, it's big because he promised, obviously earlier in this episode, he promised to take care of the wife and son. And in order for him to do that, he can't be a cop because the things he has to do to protect them are against the law. So he has to do some stuff that's going to break the law. And for him, he can't be a cop when he does it. So he's willing to give up yeah, because of the code. It's like an ethics thing if you like bone someone that's like in an active investigation. Like even if they're like, <laughs> what? Like just related to the victim. Like I think that's a no no for cops. So I mean, like, you know, <laughs> in order for <laughs> Marty to, you know, <laughs> take it home. <laughs> For the record, I don't think you see Marty bone anyone ever. I don't think he bones anyone. I think he's boneless. He can't do it or something. I don't know. So speaking of which, we go back to the sex shop now. (laughs) And the duo are going to try to find that Castillo was talking to. They go talk to a band named Surf, who seems to know who Tubbs and Crockett are. But Surf is a really weird guy, and he seems to be talking in code. He says that Carter and the other CIA agent have gone pinko. They've run off to the donut shop down the street called Pinko. I think he's trying to make a stupid joke. I mean, like that's what it was trying to come off as, right? Like, oh, they went to the donut shop, the Pinko one. <laughs> he's not funny, <laughs> but that's what he was trying to do. <laughs> Surf eventually tells them that Gretzky's wife, Laura, is former KGB, and Castillo's in a lot of trouble. So the duo take off, but we see outside... Someone put a tracking device on Tubbs' car, and Surf makes a mention how much he loves Tubbs' convertible, his olds. I don't know why Tubbs and Crockett, I guess they did put it together. Something's weird about Surf, because they continue to track Castillo, and then eventually kill Surf at the end. Spoiler. Spoiler alert. (laughs) (laughs) And then when we come back from seeing the tracking device we put on the car, we see Surf upstairs. He's with two other Russian agents, and both Carter and the other DEA agent have been killed. And then one of the Russian agents tosses Surf the tracking device, and it is like the size of a Pac-Man arcade cabinet that they're using to track (laughs) Tubbs' car. I'm telling you, that was not I think that was a video game back then. I don't even think that was really like a transmitter and they just used it or something. It was gigantic it had giant knobs on it and stuff, like a joystick. Like, are they tracking him or are they like supposed to be driving the car with that thing? <laughs> they're playing asteroids while, they, while they're driving. That's what I was telling them. Like, it's like they're playing Pong on it or something. Like, what is this thing? <laughs> we go over to the Gretzky's house and Castillo has knocked on the door. And Aaron- everyone's there weighing. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron Dara answers the door. He knows her. Uh, there's there's weird sexual tension between. Oh no, yeah, he Aaron knows Dara. her because they 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 did bone earlier. Like <laughs> they, they talk about that in a later episode or something. I think uh, like uh, they have some kind of relationship. Yeah. Mm. So gotcha. So, so yeah, Martin's, there's some Martin's Marty's kid, huh? That's what's gonna work <laughs> out. <laughs> Aaron Dara says she's glad it was Castillo that killed Gretzky. So he goes inside and he eventually talks to Laura. She seems to know him already. She says that she knows him from pictures. She's heard stories about him. We see her packing up her suitcase. And Cassio's there. like, I have to take you away. You're not safe here. She says, I'm going to wait for Jack. And then that's when she finds out in the Castillo fashion where Castillo says Jack's gone ahead. Castillo really beats around the bush. You can tell, like, it takes him a really long time to get around to the fact that, yeah, I, I, I kind of killed your husband. Well, yeah, I mean, he doesn't say that for a while. He just says, like, yeah, he went ahead, and she's like, but I wish I could have went with him. And then she Mm -hmm. catches on, like, okay. Moved on to a better place. (laughs) Just starts naming all the cliches. So, yeah, she finally comes to terms. She sends her son away. She And like you say, Melissa, she wished that she went with Jack. Uh, She asked Castillo if Jack was hurting long and if Castillo held him, which, ouch, ouch, Laura. (laughs) 
Ow, I know. Ouch. Did you hold him after you shot him? Uh, <laughs> a knife to the heart. <laughs> you can just feel the sexual tension, the way she grabs around Castillo and hugs him. You know, like these oh, two yeah. are kind of phone. That's what I thought with That's both Erendera you- and Laura. Like, there's this weird sex- sexual tension between both of those women and Castillo. That's because everyone's drawn to him. He's like a magnet or something because he's so strange. <laughs> <laughs> so now we have a, a driving scene and as melissa would say it punches you right in the feels yep right in the feels <laughs> hey why is everyone in the front seat <laughs> we asked that too like wh- we asked that too why you seat <laughs> Um, Why does it look like Marty's driving them down to the country store? (laughs) This is when we find out that the Gretzky's son, his name is Marty as well. Ouch. (laughs) And that Jack Gretzky used to tell his son, little Marty, stories about Castillo. Yep. Right in the fields. Right in the fields. Because he (laughs) loved Marty. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Castillo's eventually, he's going to eventually, he's going to take him to a small island off Key Largo. And then he says, like, hey, I'm going to tell little marty hey you like stories i'm gonna tell you a story about samurai named toshin and this is the story is like a summary of the actual miami vice episode right because toshin is basically the shogun asks him to kill an entire village to test his loyalty he says no one hides in the mountain they send every assassin after toshin he's the greatest ever so no one is able to kill him but he knows that the time what his time would come eventually he doesn't have a chance to finish the story because we finish it at the other fields part of the episode (laughs) but that's the toshin story so i'm gonna call it now so we can go back to it in future podcasts but i have a strong uh i i know castillo is gonna die just like a obi-wan kenobi style Like Strike he's me gonna down drop to become sword. more powerful than you can ever imagine. Am I supposed to tell you if, yes. if I know the answer to that? That if he dies, then I, no, and don't it, tell me. Okay, don't I tell won't me. tell you because <laughs> we'll, we'll, I know we'll, the answer. We'll learn together. So, but I just want to be able to go back to it in a few seasons. <laughs> Marty stops the story short because he sees a confidence rearview mirror. He just tells everyone to hold on, and then Jesus, <laughs> it's the fuzz. <laughs> <laughs> and then we flash to. The duo pull it up next to a cop car, and the cop says that he lost Castillo. This scene is so ridiculous. The the duo shows up, and they pull over to a rest stop where there's this cop car. And then out of nowhere, this bad guy rolls, just drives up, starts shooting at him, and just rams the cop car. And, and, they, and the cop car and the other car just explode, and everyone yeah. jumps into the water. Okay, and it's like so, completely random. Like, <laughs> so many questions. There's Why? so many things. There's so many great things that happen in this scene. First, they pull up to the cop. And the cop says he lost Castillo. He's like, but the island is small. There's a bunch of abandoned buildings and, quote, a bunch of shit. Roads on islands don't go anywhere. It's a fucking <laughs> of island. It, yeah, of course it's a bunch of dead end roads. <laughs> uh, uh, That's what an no, island is. Damn it, they drove around. <laughs> Well, if they have, like, some kind of hover boat or something, or hover car. And then you're right, John. Also, this black Bronco pulls up, which should have been suspicious, because the uh, because the roads of the island go nowhere. So why would so anyone why else be driving out here? <laughs> they shoot, kill the cop who falls in the water, and then they ram the cop car. Tubbs and Crockett jump into the water to avoid it. And then, of course, because it's Miami, as it soon explodes. as waters touch, <laughs> as soon as cars touch water... They explode. Yes. Explosion for explosion sake. Yeah, but once exactly. again, why ram the cop car? <laughs> like there's just two people. You're in a you're in a Bronco with automatic weapons. Like it shouldn't be that hard. Just hit the duo or shoot them. <laughs> yeah, they they ram the car, goes to the water, explodes. They jump out of their Bronco and just run away. Now we're gonna go to the safe house, and this is where we're gonna be for the remainder of the episode. First of all, this place is freaking gigantic. It's like four stories tall. So it's not not hiding very well. Unless no, it's hiding. not. <laughs> I mean, why go somewhere where there's so many places that you that could be hidden like people could hide in yeah not only that but if the island is em- it has a few abandoned buildings and roads that go where let's hide in the freaking empty ho- hotel sized house yeah on exactly the, on this island mm-hmm. <laughs> so we see we have a couple feel scenes here first castillo goes in and talks to laura she begs him take little marty with you let the kgb kill her and they because they won't stop until they get and maybe that will be a re- revenge enough but of course, Castillo's like, no way, I'm sworn to protect you. 
that's that's what I'm going to do. And then she tells Castillo how they met. She was an actress in Russia. She was hired to fall in love with Gretzky and then you know, help the KGB kill him. But then they really fall in love. They both defect together. They try to run away. He tried to quit from the CIA, but everyone found them. So they've been on the run ever since. And we get it. It. enough with the play she's been in love with marty this whole time we get it <laughs> also little They're marty is just away hanging out in the hallway family <laughs> yeah and little marty's just hanging out in the hallway listening to all this like wait what yeah i know what? poor guy he's like what my mom did what <laughs> yeah hey watch my dad's this what? martin <laughs> you gotta bone your mom <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna make three more marty's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so then castillo goes out into the hallway and he finds little little marty who's coloring they he takes him upstairs to like the fourth floor yeah why did he take him so far away <laughs> i don't um, know could he I, have had a conversation by the coloring books or was that too distracting yeah no he's like i think because his i think because what he was going to give him mm, which mm. whatever why can't you just bring that downstairs with you because you're going to go talk to him anyway was upstairs so he's like come with me and he packs up his coloring stuff in his little ba- his little bag and takes mm-hmm. him up like nine stories <laughs> <laughs> you need to go to bed martin that uh, I'm telling you, things might move pretty fast with your mom downstairs. <laughs> well, for the record, this is why, I, for the record, she she is upstairs where they are. So that's what I'm saying. The kid went downstairs with his coloring stuff. And then w- when he heard them talking, he saw, remember, you can see him in the background. He leaves. He goes downstairs. Mm, okay. Because he's uncomfortable. I think he can hear them talking when they're talking about how they met and all that, whatever. Marty, when he leaves the room talking with Laura, he takes something with him and he puts it into another room and then he goes downstairs and gets the kid and then brings marty upstairs so he can give it to him so she and can, he, she's in the other room so that's, that's why she can hear i'm just saying that because that's okay. an important part of the story mm, okay she can hear him telling little marty the story when he finishes his story she can hear him that makes so that's more why sense. she does okay. what she does so i'm just like <laughs> putting that ahead of it <laughs> okay but so marty tells little martin a very uncomfortable story a very <laughs> like story you know similar to uh what christopher Watkins' character told to uh bruce willis <laughs> bruce willis little bruce willis yeah see, well, Cat- a- castillo had to hold this sword <laughs> up his butt while they were in an internment camp in vietnam <laughs> for three years castillo his got- father carried it up his butt for five Five years, but he died of dysentery. Castillo so, goes in little... and he finishes the story about Toshin. He says that the clan finally sent Toshin's best friend to go finish the job, basically, to go fight Toshin. Toshin couldn't kill his best friend. They they battle with swords. He he stops short of cutting Toshin, but then his friend accidentally hits Toshin too hard and kills him. But the law of the Bushido, the way of the warrior, the rule of the warrior, Toshin knew that his family would always be safe because his best friend would take care of him. But his best friend's heart was broken. And that's when he turns and he hands little Marty a samurai sword. Sorry, I killed your dad. Here's a sword. <laughs> yeah, so that's what I'm saying. So she's overhearing him tell the story. She didn't know until that point that he is the one that did it. Mm-hmm. You get what I'm saying? Like, so she didn't know. So that's why mm-hmm. she, that's when she does what she does when she comes in the room. And she's like, wait yeah. a minute. Okay. I'm she walks in story. behind him, puts her hand on his shoulder, and then stabs him with a mini samurai sword right in the back. <laughs> so many samurai swords yes. in this. <laughs> <laughs> See, and this that that's his fault. He was trying to run a game on her. You know, he <laughs> killed her husband. He's trying to replace her husband. You know, came up to bite him in the butt. <laughs> Little Marty asks what's going on. She says that he killed your dad. And then she grabs Little Marty and starts to run. But the front, at the front door, as soon as she opens the front door, Surf is there. She shoots him, but misses somehow and only hits him in the shoulder and then takes off, tries to run out through the basement. Maybe that's why she's not KGB so anymore. Take- she's a terrible <laughs> shot. <laughs> I do want to point out that none of the Russian people in this episode are very Russian. Apparently, well, they- people don't, there are not a lot of actors in Miami that can do Russian accents, apparently. They do when they- when he when they're at the the porn shop and surf after they got done putting it on the car they start talking in russian he's like i don't ever want to hear you talk in russian again so i think that's why they don't talk in it very much in the episode okay. yeah good like, job ever james almost director to hide the shame of your actor's terrible russian accents yeah, by making like, it a plot yes. point 
<laughs> never speak in Russian again. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you're please right. don't try that again. <laughs> it was terrible. Yeah. So he just wanted to make it a point. Like this is why that's a that's our way of saying like this is why we're not going to talk in Russian ever again in this episode. It's going to be all in English because we're trying to hide that they're not. <laughs> this is when it gets it gets great because it gets great for Marty. Right. Yes. Laura takes little Marty. They run down to the basement. That's where Surf goes with them. But upstairs, Marty gets up and he distracts so they have to split the russians up and two of them go upstairs to go get castillo and then that's when castillo lays his samurai trap <laughs> yes he goes all ninja in one of the funniest kill scenes ever as the guy's walking <laughs> down the hallway and all of a sudden he throws the sword out like yeah <laughs> and then spins around into the other room and it is just hilarious I, I i literally laughed out loud when i saw that he didn't laugh when he was like hanging onto the ceiling, like <laughs> spread across the the room, <laughs> and then jump down. Well, all while he's been stabbed, right? He's like bleeding to death, but he stretches out the length of the of the ceiling, basically, and he's like yes. hanging he's on. Moving pretty good, getting shanked. Exactly, he's <laughs> clinging to the wall. This proves once again. You do not fuck with Martin Castillo because he ninjas the fuck out of those two guys that come up there. They didn't even stand a chance. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to mess with this, this guy. He will kill you and take your family. <laughs> I mean, is it any surprise? Like, have you guys not seen American Me? Should oh, we yeah. be surprised with that Edward James almost is a badass? He spent that whole uh, uh, movie just being a badass. That's all he is. After Castillo just massacres people with a samurai sword upstairs, Laura is trying to hide from Surf. Surf's walking around with an automatic machine gun. Laura drops her gun, so she's just trying to hide. At the last second, Castillo busts in through some lattice that's like on the side, grabs them, and they start running off through the yard towards the water. So he's really starting to struggle now he's limping he's bleeding from where she stabbed him you're being hunted by the kgb why did you stab the one person that's there to protect you because she's an idiot <laughs> <laughs> so then they get out to the palm trees and castillo turns to little marty and says don't move stay right here don't move and they spread out hiding behind three trees and surf comes pulling up this is the final scene of the episode or so this final just, section just of the episode. realize he's he's driving dubs olds across the lawn driving it with his feet okay <laughs> i could not we were talking about that i'm like how the hell is he driving it with his feet he, he's still moving forward with his feet so who's steering it who's pressing the gas yeah, who's, who's doing the pedals if he's doing the steering wheel yes. with his feet like, is there someone hiding underneath the steering wheel, like pushing with their hands or something? Is he, I, I, I was thrown off by that. that. I, could... I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Surf stops the car. He gets out. He goes into this long explanation, like why he's going to kill them all. Laura pops out. And when she pops out, little Marty goes running over to protect his mom. And that's when Castillo turns out with the sa with his samurai sword. Surf then starts to explain to Castillo basically why he's going to kill him. And at the last second, Tubbs and Crockett pop out from behind different palm trees. <laughs> Crockett shouts out, hey, pal. He turns and they shoot and kill Surf's Surf. up. <laughs> Surf up, dude. <laughs> That's what he go. He says, "Surfs up" when he pops out. Which, how long were they hiding behind those trees? Why didn't yeah. they come Why help they... when everything was going down in the house? Yeah, I wondered that too. Were they like, told to wait behind the trees? I don't even think the Castillo knew they were there. Why didn't Tubbs get his car back? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think that, he, that I don't even think that Castillo knew they were there. So which makes it even like can they worse. teleport? Yeah, were they just watching him struggle? Like he was like all limping around and everything, and they're like, "Oh no, it's not the right time yet. He doesn't need us yet. Don't worry, we'll pop out just the right time and say the, just the, the best cliche thing we can say." <laughs> I, 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 they had to have been there before because that scene happens very quickly. They run out of the house. The guy drives across the lawn. And they're hiding behind trees. And then we don't see anyone come sneaking up behind the trees. I guess they were just hiding there the whole time. I don't know. It's very strange and a very Deu ek machina, like force of God kind of ending. I was really hoping for Castillo to samurai surf in half. Just cut him right in half with that sword. <laughs> You know, do oh, some ninja move off one of the palm trees, spike the sword through his neck, episode over. Kung Fu movie style where he just flies in the air with the sword <laughs> out and stabs yeah. him. <laughs> so in the last section of the, the last moment in the episode, we see the boat 
the boat that's going to fishing. Yeah, <laughs> that the boat is going to take Laura and little Marty out to that island off off of Key Largo. We hear that Marty used four hundred sixty thousand of the five hundred thousand to take care of Laura and little Marty, but that Why Marty not? also it's not plans. His money. <laughs> Marty says it's it's no problem. It'll all be lost in the sauce. No, it, Marty doesn't say that. That was wrong. I wanted to tell you that before. I forgot. When we watched it, the subtitle said that Marty said that, but that wasn't Marty that says that. That's Tubbs. Mm. Tub, that doesn't, doesn't that sound like not something that Marty would say, right? It's like Tubbs yeah. says, don't worry. It, it won't matter anyway. It'll all be lost in the sauce or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's what, yeah. And we just see the boat pull away, and that's the end of the episode. Castillo did what, although I, I challenge his code of the Bushido because he's not going to be there anymore to protect him. He's just sending him off to some leper island. For he them sent to them, live. And when he said in the cars that he sent them with people that he trusted. So he wasn't mm-hmm. sending them by themselves. They were going with somebody. He wasn't going to say who that was. But the, it's the people that he trusted for that he or whatever that he knew and trusted. So he was not sending them to go by themselves. Question. Who's going to spend more time with their kid? Marty spending his time <laughs> with Martin? <laughs> or Crockett with his son. <laughs> for the record, I think Martin gets for the record, more Martin um, time. <laughs> Crockett will eventually. I don't think it, it's not in season two, but he will eventually. Go what, back is this to kid going to show up? His kid's like seventeen all of a sudden. <laughs> no, he actually hasn't aged any when he comes back. But but you'll see him. He comes back. Oh, so he he makes a big verbs. strong. The last two seasons of Miami Vice, there's a big, strong storyline with his son. Oh, do we Someday. have to watch those? <laughs> yeah, I know. I don't like those episodes either. Well, that's the end of this episode. So let's go talk about, John, I know the music is going to be real light unless you want to talk about a lot of instrumental. <laughs> Samurai co- music. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So oh, it sounds like it's oh, going to be. want to talk a- about fairies and bushes. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go over and talk about the music. All right, John, what do you got for us this week? We only got two songs, and one of them is a repeat offender in <laughs> Brian <offender>. Ferry. <laughs> <laughs> so Brian Ferry, the English singer-songwriter, you get the song Boys and Girls off his album, Boys and Girls, uh, released in 1985. So we've already had one of his songs, and we will get another one of his songs, all three songs, off of this same album with their song Slave to Love being the most popular song on the album. The song Boys and Girls, by the way, did not chart. So this is this was Brian Ferry's first solo album in seven years. He was the lead singer of the band Roxy Music, if you remember from me talking about him before. This album was actually the first album since disbanding with Roxy Music, and it's actually his most successful solo album. Part of the reason it might be his most successful solo album is because some of the guitar that are featured on the album. Uh, So, like, at the end of the song Slave to Love, there's a guitar solo by Neil Hubbard, who was the guitarist for Roxy Music, but also backup guitarist for Joe Cocker and B.B. King, but also featured Mike Knopfler, the guitarist from Dire Straits, David Gilmore Pink Floyd's guitarist, Nile Rogers from Cheap, and the Canadian Brian Adams guitarist, Keith Scott. Uh, some pretty good guitarists on, on that album. Wow. Yeah. That was actually surprising. Like this guy, this guy came out of nowhere. I can know I had never even heard of him up until the last few weeks. As we had Brian barely. It was if it wasn't last week, it was the week before. Like just just recently. So this album peaked number one in the UK, which is actually kind of a trend here because both of our artists this week are really big in the UK. But as an American, I'm like who? <laughs> so we'll get to our next song, which is "Hello Earth" by Kate Bush. This is off her album "Hounds of Love" from 1985. This particular song did chart but the uh album actually contained bush's only top 40 hit overall top 40 not the song running up the hill she is an english singer songwriter just like fairy and actually she's kind of just as accomplished once again because i'm from america really don't know her because her music's pretty much really popular in the uk in 1978 
in 19, she topped the UK charts for four weeks with her debut single, Weathering Heights. Since that release, she's released 25 UK top 40 singles, 10 albums. So Kate Bush has also done some TV stuff and some soundtrack stuff. She's actually done a ton of it. Looking through it, the only thing, like the soundtrack stuff, the only movie I recognized was Golden Compass, and there was a John Hughes movie on there. Other than that, mostly British movies. That I've probably never seen. She was featured in a couple made for BBC movies that were produced by the company The Comic Strip, including a black comedy film called Less Dogs, in which she wears a wedding dress and doesn't talk in almost the entire movie. So I guess you can call that I mean, a movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You've got an hour to kill. Don't rent that. <laughs> don't don't rent that. <laughs> so, you know, this is Wikipedia. Some stuff you might not know about Kate Bush if you know who Kate Bush is, is that she knows karate. Her brother was in a karate club in college, and she would train there sometimes. So she knows karate. <laughs> and then they, they make a point at the beginning of her Wikipedia to mention that her father isn't was an amateur pianist. And then later they say <laughs> that she is self-taught, uh, she self-taught herself to play the piano at age 11. Which I'm calling shenanigans on that if her dad's a pianist yeah. um, that she taught herself. Well, technically, I'm an amateur pianist because I've tried to play the piano a few times and then stopped. And so. I'm an amateur pianist because I played it a few times in a target. <laughs> yeah. But she also played organ and dabbled in the violin. Hmm. So Interesting. there's your music. I guess the music had to get out of the way for the for the Castillo story. And it was the same for Golden Triangle. I think there was in the Golden Triangle, there was a whole bunch of music in the first half, but in the second half where we got deep into Castillo's background, there wasn't much music. So I guess hmm. I'm not surprised. But I'm always let down. I'm yeah, always let and down when there isn't and the, more. The, and the music was, like you said, like space as far as possible. You had music in the open, and then you had music during Laura's escape at the very end. There's nothing in between. Hopefully yeah. next week we'll get back on track, and hopefully we'll stop repeating artists. Well, we're getting very close to Phil the Shill, so there's there's gonna there's got to be a ton of music in Phil, in Phil the Shill, too. Oh, yeah. All right, well, let's go over and talk about our final thoughts this episode because I think I think there's one person in the group who wants to gush about how much they love this episode. Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to start with my final thoughts episode so I can get out of your guys' way for the for your guys' final thoughts. So I know you guys both really like this episode. And I have nothing against this episode. I, I really did enjoy it. It's a good episode. It's well-directed, right? We I talked about in our pre-show like is thematically and visually better than any other my advice episode we've watched so far there's long gaps in time in the episode where no one talks where nothing happens they just sit there so you're supposed to take in the whole scene but it also isn't the most exciting thing to watch you know and i think i've made it pretty clear throughout the run of the episode i really enjoy the silly slapstick kind of episodes that happen it maybe wasn't my favorite but it was still really good and it was really well done. The story was was really well thought out. I fully expected Jack Gretzky to be alive at the end and be some sort of setup and do this weird TV twist. But it stuck with the sad story that it was his. Yeah, he had to kill his best friend and then had to take care of his family. And they he almost loses them, but does the amazing Castillos thing where he is in, invincible and a god among men. So I really did enjoy the episode, and I'm just gonna get out of the way of John and Melissa. Melissa's final thoughts in this so, episode. I want to start first. That way, Melissa can correct me or yell at me or whatever. <laughs> oh, I'm um, already ready. No, I'm, just I'm already so, ready to yell at you. What do you want me to yell at you about? <laughs> I just want to say I really like this episode. And I, I like this episode because we just kind of got the plot out of the way. We just got into it. It was a Castillo episode. We had the ninja stuff. We had the, you know, running to the safe house, the Russian hit mob all going on. And I didn't mind. I expected because it was a Castillo episode, I expected the silent scenes of just the looks and stuff because that's the Castillo stuff. You got a little bit of sword play. You got a little samurai stuff. You got a little bit of, of that mystery mysterious background of Castillo. You still got some vice in it with like the open with them popping out of the sand and <laughs> the little break where they have the 
explosion just for the sake of the explosion like it was a it, it was still a very miami vice s episode it was also fun because it was that mysterious kung fu castillo episode and i'm always interested in learning more about castillo's backstory because i, I i'm just waiting for the chance when they break it to us that he's he's actually wolverine or, <laughs> highlander you, you know you keep, you, you keep uh, saying yeah, highlander. highlander or maybe he was uh supposed to be james bond he was 006, you know? <laughs> Melissa, what are your final thoughts on this episode? Well, I mean, it's no secret that I love this episode. I was waiting, dying, dying, and I was hoping that you weren't going to say anything bad so I didn't have to yell at you about it. <laughs> I love this episode. I love all I things. I think it's a little classless that Marty was trying to nail the, de- the <laughs> okay. dead guy's wife. First of all, he was not trying to nail anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so he, trying to get in there no he was not he was nothing but respectful because that's all he ever is trying for some russia with love <laughs> yeah no like i said i love marty so i love martin because he is the epitome of you can't say he's crooked you can never say he does anything that's questionable whether you like him all the time or you know what i mean sometimes you might think like well that was kind of harsh like when Tubbs was all drugged up and he was rolling his eyes at him last episode like what the hell's wrong with you <laughs> would you just do your Even fucking Marty's job mustache is <laughs> all business bump. right it's all business yeah so i mean i love it's everything standard, about it it's standard must, mustache protocol exactly <laughs> yeah. four inches exactly. in length cut it's like he gets a ruler and he measures it before he cuts it. But no, like I said, I love everything about him. And there are several other episodes where it's just him. It still goes back into his background. And I love those episodes. He's all mystery. He's, you know, but, you know, but John's right. It's still fun because it still has, I'm going to blow this car up for no reason. And we're going to hide behind these trees and no one's going to see us. But we've been here all along. Like, what? <laughs> this doesn't yes. make any sense. <laughs> well, that's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We hope you enjoyed this episode this was uh, coming off of last week last week's episode was i think we were pretty consistent that we did not like that episode so we're back with this week and we it sound, we all loved this episode so it was a strong miami vice episode we hope you enjoyed this episode of go with the heat we would love 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 to hear from you you can email the show go with the heat at gmail.com go to our website go with the click on about us you can find all the ways that you can yell at us twitter facebook tumblr any way that you want to get a hold of us we would love to hear from you you can subscribe to the show you know we have a youtube channel stitcher itunes google play you can pretty much find us anywhere we'd love to have you review our show on one of those platforms too it helps more people find our show and share it around we'd, we'd like to see some more people find the greatness that was miami vice that's gonna do it for us this week and we'll see y'all next time Bye, pal.